welcome to another uh, video from the playersaid.com. My name's Alexander, and today we are joined by Ben Ho, and we're here at WBC 2019. And Ben Ho, if you don't know, which you should, is the designer of Fields of Fire, which is one of my favorite solitaire games. Uh, it's and it has a reputation for being very deep and very rich. Um, there's a lot in there. It just came out with volume two, yes. which I have, and I'm plowing my way through the rule book, and that looks very good too. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about today is something you're already working on, which is a an expansion campaign for volume one. Yes. So let's tell us about the title and what this is about. All right. So we're looking at a Battle of the Bulge expansion for volume one. Uh, it uh, takes the base kit. Uh, and uh, we add a deck of cards so for, uh, we can cover the terrain and the Arden. Uh, and then about uh, half a sheet of counters, so we include all the German armor and, and, and half tracks, trucks, and, and a couple other weapons. And, and then a couple of pieces for Bangalore torpedoes and special cases from the, uh, the missions. Uh, so the campaign is, uh, takes the same unit from the first volume, uh, moves forward to December 1944, uh, and has eight missions. Uh, there are three defensive missions and five offensive missions. Uh, to uh, kind of walk your company through. Uh, and so at this point, the Americans are kind of on the, the high point of their tactical skills. So uh, your company starts as uh, veterans. Yes. Uh, and then uh, the struggle is how can you keep as many of your veterans through uh, this, this kind of titanic struggle that takes place on the northern end of the bulge. Uh, so there was a very famous battle at the Rock Around Creek Kelt, uh, and that's where the defensive missions are. Uh, versus the 12th SS Panther Division, uh, and then uh, a series of offensive uh, missions right after that where the uh, 9th Infantry leads the, leads the way in Germany. Uh, so, uh, of the three major actions that the, the 9th Infantry was in in World War II, you, you get the Normandy campaign in the box yep. with Volume 1, uh, the Bulge was the other one, and the only campaign that we haven't done yet is the Siege and, and Assault of Brest. Uh, so that might come yet. someday. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was an urban campaign. So hint, hint, volume two. Uh, so, uh, and and that way we would cover the Ninth Infantry in World War II. Uh, now that we have two kits out, uh, now we can cross pollinate between the two because they have pieces and parts that mm. uh, that we can work. So we're also working no, on no. Uh, more expansion campaigns uh, with the existing counters and the terrain covers. So uh, we're looking at uh, uh, Marines uh, not fighting in Way City. Uh, I had, had the opportunity to meet the battalion commander of 1st Battalion 5th Marines uh, in Vietnam in 1967. He was there. I was still a wee lad. <laughs> but uh, when I went later on, he was a retired colonel by that time. And so Colonel Hillgardner told me about the experience. I would like to capture that. It's a series of battles in, in, uh, in Vietnam in uh, the summer of 1967. Uh, in uh, it was Operations Union 1, Union 2. Uh, the battalion got back to back presidential unit citations for a lot of heavy fighting. It lends itself to a campaign because it does go over a series of months that was focused on fighting in a particular area. We've already had the tactical maps, the timelines. That's, that's coming. That would use the, uh, the deck, the Vietnam deck from the first volume. Uh, in, uh, but we would get uh, uh, Viet Cong and, and uh, North Vietnamese troops from uh, the first volume, uh, the Marines from the second volume, kind of mixed together. Uh, we can also do something similar in Korea because the uh, 5th Marines uh, fought in the Busan Perimeter Campaign. Uh, that's where the picture on the front of the box comes from. Yep. Well, so we'll have a campaign where they're fighting the North Koreans uh, in the Busan Campaign in August of 1950. Uh, so, that, those are kind of the next three campaigns we get. Uh, we're also pulling together a, another box set uh, where we're looking at uh, paratroopers and rangers. So instead of just one regiment, we're going to expand the aperture so we can kind of hit some different things. Uh, so uh, kind of airborne ranger approach to it, we can look at something as modern as um, modern day raids in Afghanistan, uh, uh, all the way to garbage rangers, paratroopers. So it'd be kind of a different mix of things, uh, but uh, now we've kind of got a base built, we can start extending from that. Right That's very exciting stuff for the future. Yes. With this particular campaign, now you've mentioned before, it's kind of 
the, how it's going to be released kind of dictates what we're going to get with it. Yes, so we had targeted a C3I release uh, so the, you know, they can accommodate the counters easily. So the trick is the cards. Uh, they do cards, they did cards with a previous uh, uh, with, uh, South Pacific, you know, Mark Urban's game there. So they can do cards on a, uh, you know, eight to a sheet, uh, perforated sheet. So they're not quite as awesome as like a playing deck. They're pretty good for what we're doing, uh, and, and it, it's a way to get it out to, to the folks fairly easily. And we're targeting a 32 card deck for that, for the terrain. Uh, if, uh, if that can't be kind of worked out uh, from a production schedule, we'll just run it right through a P500 as a battle pack, uh, and you'll get a full 55 cards, because if, if I have to print a deck, you get a whole deck. Uh, so uh, that makes the map building easier with 55 cards, uh, but I did all the math so we can get all the all eight maps out of 32 cards by combining like uh, you know, hills and forest, I make a forest hill card versus two different cards. So one thing with the cards, the terrain cards that I noticed with Volume 2, I some, a lot of the maps have a lot more kind of set structures to them. Yes. Um, with like historical terrains, the beach landings, the yeah. airfields, things like that. With this, do we have a similar type of thing? So we're right in the middle of that. Uh, so. Uh, so the challenge with like a beach terrain, you know, I couldn't do the full random cards like in Volume 1 because the beach has to be at the bottom. Uh, so uh, for some of these very historical missions, the terrain, the general terrain was very important to how the defense was conducted. So on a, a completely random map, you're going to miss the kind of the historical significance of defending the village. And, and uh, so it, it's a combination. You have some variability to whether you're going to be in a regular village or going to have the church. Uh, and, so, and then the open ground between the, the forest and the kind of the critical defense of Greenfield, uh, you know, there's a road. And so, so the variability that you'll have between planes is how does the road get to you? There's a road embankment and it kind of follows uh, you know, uh, a couple different paths. It can, it can curve coming into you, it can go straight at you, or it can, it, it can fork. Uh, and uh, because of the weather and terrain, the, the German armor has to follow along the road, and so that, so that can really change how you defend the town. So, uh, you, so it's kind of a hybrid of the two. You get a little bit of variability, uh, and then the, the the later missions, uh, there's a good bit more variability, uh, kind of more familiar, it's similar to the first volume. Uh, but with the 32 cars. Uh, I do need to have some of it, like there's a hill, you'll need to have that, a hill in a particular row, and then you can build the rest uh, in a variable way around that. Um, outside of that, I know you said there's going to be a ton of German armor, it's a bulge game, where do yeah. be without the tanks? Yes. Um, what's it going to be like having World War II kind of tanks? Is it just kind of uh, heavy weapons like bazookas and things, or do, or do the Americans get tanks as well? So the uh, so. The 2nd Infantry Division was supported by a tank battalion and two tank destroyer battalions during the battle. So at, at different times, you'll be supported by towed and a tank guns, uh, a couple different kinds. You know, so the tank destroyer battalions have the big 76 millimeter and a tank gun, uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the battalion itself had its little 57 millimeter, uh, the, the old British six pounders. Yeah. yeah, that's what we got. You, get, you got one of those. Uh, so you got those. Uh, and there is some variability what you get, so there's some random draw because it was kind of mix and match across the line, whether you're getting Shermans, Shermans with the 76 gun, or the, the M10 tank destroyers. Uh, so in this sector, that's all. That's what you had to choose from. Other parts of the battlefield had uh, the M18 uh, and, and some uh, and the 90 millimeter gun, which is a much better gun, but at the ranges where most of this battle took place, uh, and they'd already, the tank destroyers had already had uh, been equipped with the high bath rounds, which were brand new, uh, much more effective ammunition, and they were they were literally rushing them to the front, and, and tanks were getting like, here's two, use this wisely, right? And so, uh, and, and at the ranges, this fighting was going on, those high bath rounds were cut straight through uh, and even a Panther uh, at the range. So, uh, so the Germans have some challenges. Uh, so you'll have M10 tank destroyers or tanks, uh, and usually at the section level. So you'll have two tanks, and you might get a headquarters event that brings in two more, because they were, during the fighting, they were kind of parceling them out two or three at a time to kind of plug the holes and keep everybody from, you know, keep the, the line from collapsing. The Germans tended to run 
uh, almost uh, almost exclusively five tanks at a time. They would just run five tanks and then uh, uh, infantry attack. And then they would, the coordination between the two would break down, which clearly indicated that the Germans just weren't that well trained. The division 12th SS Panther Division had been destroyed in the Normandy campaign. I mean, literally, from 20,000 men, only 300 men came out of ballets. So they had to rebuild the division from scratch in October of 44. So between October 44 and December 16, there just wasn't much time to train. Uh, so they, they were like a whole new levy building a division from scratch in six weeks and putting it in the line against a veteran U.S. division that was lavishly supported with artillery. Because that's the other critical piece is you know, with Americans at this point in time, we had so much artillery that the Germans gave us a good target. As long as you keep your FO alive, you can pound them in dust. Uh, so you know, that's the challenge for the AI for the Germans is don't let the artillery blast you to bits. And as far as kind of that cohesion between armor and infantry and the German level of kind of training, how is that put into the AI? So the, the AI builds that into how the force packages are generated. So when the, the uh, when you resolve a potential contact, all the force packages are based on the actual size and breadth of, of the German attacks at that time. And so uh, the, what, there's some campaign-specific rules that they can drive how the tanks behave. The tanks just tended, to, like the Germans said, uh, historically did, just keep on driving, moving along slowly. If something was knocked out in front of them, they'd sit there for a while and they kind of think about it and they push it out of the way. And, then, and, and they seem to be kind of blissfully unaware of what the infantry was doing. Uh, you know, the, the tanks uh, would go after the American positions if they could spot one. They'd roll right up on it and just ground, ground them down. So, uh, there was some uh, pretty heavy fighting there. You know, uh, with, uh, one company of the 9th Infantry, after the battle, uh, only had 11 effectives left uh, out of what's typically almost 200 soldiers. And uh, generally speaking, I know this is kind of playtest stuff here. Do we know when this might be ready for the printers? Uh, so uh, the the campaign itself is very far along. So really, at this point, the the, uh, uh, the, the play testing is kind of in its final stages of just the, the, the tweaks on the, the campaign-specific rules, how that plays out in this particular mission. Uh, so uh, that's the good news. The hard part is I've got it all laid out, and we've got it all on spreadsheets. The math is done, and we have a little bit of tweak here and there to play test. Uh, so the bottleneck is when did I get it into print? Uh, and that's kind of like always a challenge car. with uh, our hobby. Right. This is, uh, I can have it done in the tank, and then how long does it take to print? Uh, I think C3I uh, is about twice a year, uh, and so we could see it uh, in, in the next one or the one after if that works out. I'm working with them now on you know, can they accommodate the cards, et cetera, in their plan for cost and balance of that. If not, uh, and I'll get an answer pretty soon on that. Then we'll just take it around and, and put it be a P500 as a battle pack. And then it'll probably be sometime next year, uh, if I'm uh, in that room, maybe. Uh, yeah, I mean, the nice thing with the battle packs, this is pretty simple. It's not like a full box set. So That's true. A full box set takes a while. You know, a half a sheet of counters uh, and a deck of cards uh, is, is pretty quick. I'll be able to push that through. Well, I appreciate you sitting down with me and showing me this. Um, I love this game, so Thank you. More, more of it the merrier, especially German tanks. Yes. Uh, uh, I feel like in the Normandy campaign, find a lot of infantry, and I would get my butt handed to me, and it'd be nice, hopefully, to do the butt handing back to the German tanks. Uh, and yes. feel good inside. Uh, yeah, because, yeah, in this playtest, uh, you, uh, you know, at this point here, I've already inflicted. 12 step losses and knocked out two half tracks. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, the, the Germans are having a, a tough time. Uh, their, their artillery prep fire seemed like it was uh, just shredding me pretty good, but then I was able to uh, uh, kind of reassemble the line just in time to stop the, the infantry assault. So, it worked out pretty good. Awesome. I appreciate you sitting down with me, and thank you very much for watching. Thank you. Very excited for this one. This awesome. has been Ben Hull. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you very much.